So I'd like to invite up. Let's see who I'm inviting up. No, there we go. Uh, David Taylor, Terry Hyman Patterson, and Orla Hardiman, who will deliver, who will be virtually, who will deliver our panel, Multidisciplinary Care, History and Evolution of Multidisciplinary Care, along with Rachel and I. Yeah. <laughs> so, you, so now you're in charge, David, so I don't know where you... Hello, everyone. It's a very intimidating audience because, um, well, as you, if you were here earlier, you saw our Canadian clinicians, and while they're big on research, they're so passionate about the people that they do their work for. So to have that as someone who we connect with every week is pretty amazing. I, my name is David Taylor. I'm the VP of Research and Strategic Partnerships, so like wholly unqualified for this. Um, and, uh, but also my significant other is one of those individuals that Dr. Genge referred to as being ensconced in the ALS clinic. And shout out to the neuro team at, in Montreal as well because I heard for years and years about the importance of what all of you do. And so from a research perspective, how valuable that's been, I can't even begin to tell you. Um, the other reason why I'm up here is because Kathy asked me to do this because I'm a huge nerd for ALS history, and so I'm going to give you just this, if this works. Okay, so the slide that I give at a bunch of research talks is one of the things, the evolution of ALS research, and when you get to the 1970s, you sort of get to the first people that are the birth of ALS research. And so Dr. Forbes Norris from here in California, uh, and, and Dee Norris, who was mentioned yesterday, um, you know, it's believed that they're probably the first sort of dedicated people to ALS and to the idea of multidisciplinary care. And in fact, I found old documentation in our records uh, that says it's going to be really hard to read, but it was actually from the former version of the ALS Association where uh, our, co our co-founder went and visited and said that, that Dr. Norris had the only pure motor neuron disease clinic. And, and so in Canada, we actually had two gentlemen in the mid-70s who were talking about the need for multidisciplinary care, Dr. Arthur Hudson on the left and Dr. Andy Eisen on the right. And, uh, and, and in fact, Dr. Hudson started multidisciplinary care in Canada in 1977, and Dr. Eisen in 1980 in Vancouver. And, uh, and, and one of the things that I just found so fascinating because, and, and Dr. Hyman Patterson and I were talking about where's the first sort of place where there's been some sort of documentation of the idea of a multidisciplinary care team all in one place. And so there's these Great newspaper articles from the late 1970s, around 1978, in, in, in Ontario, in Canada, um, of, of Dr. Hudson and his team. And this article really talks about, and, and I wish I'd put the other piece in there, the OT and the PT and the SLP, and really highlights the work that they were doing and how essential they were. And, and when you go back into our old minutes, oh, and even some of the documents, like he wouldn't even go into the the things, because he felt that he was the least important part of the team uh, compared to what he called was the group of ALS support personnel. And so if you go to some of the old ALS kind of minutes from our first year, uh, the reason why our organization really, one of the things he wanted to have an organization like ours to start was because he wanted this to spread across Canada. And he wanted to find the neurologists working on ALS across Canada and make multidisciplinary care clinics part of a network across the country. So I've always found that really fascinating because it wasn't fully embraced until several years later outside of North America, and it was around that time in other areas of North America. And I just love some of the things he said that, you know, um, in his personal experience, I believe that no disease in the civilized world presents a greater need to be cured than this. And this is in the mid-70s, and, and, and really, um, I've, I found that very fascinating. Anyways, and then so I was talking to Kathy about this, and I had this presentation that I was going to give at the research forum we had in 2020 that got canceled, and it was all around the history of multidisciplinary care, and I was calling everyone and asking about it and everything, and then Kathy said, you're going to moderate this panel. So that's all of that. So, but it's, it is such 
an honor. I'm going to get that slide off of there because I don't, can, can we take it down? Because what I don't want to do is focus on that anymore. What I would like to do is focus on the fact that it's such a privilege to be here with an incredible group of individuals uh, and to moderate this session. Um, when I looked at their bios to introduce them, uh, you can't because it's too big, it's too broad. They, they've won all the awards, everyone. <laughs> Uh, I think Dr. Hardiman won an award last week for Researcher of the Year. Um, they're on every panel. They have moderated everything. So I'm just going to do, and I'm going to read this time, their official titles. And I know this is a little redundant for, for, for Sarah and for Rachel. But uh, so Sarah Feldman is PT, DPT, and a ATP, a physical therapist and assistive technology professional at the MDA ALS Center of Hope at Temple University, Lewis Katz School of Medicine. For over 25 years, she's been helping people with ALS MND. Uh, I'm doing this alphabetically. Uh, Doctor or Professor Orla Hardiman, who should be joining us online. Oh, I see. Hi, Professor Hardiman, is a professor of neurology, head of academic unit of neurology at Trinity College Dublin, consultant neurologist at Beaumont Hospital, and director of National ALS Service, and I, I couldn't get into the million of other things that she's currently doing, and, and she has been uh, working with people for ALS MND for over 30 years. Uh, we have Dr. Terry Hyman Patterson, who is a professor of neurology at the Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University, director of the Center of Neurodegenerative Diseases for MDA ALS Center of Hope uh, for about 40 years since she started her multidisciplinary care clinic, which is incredible. And as you've met already, Rachel Marsden, who is the Motor Neuron Disease Care Center Coordinator for Oxford Care Center for over 20 years, uh, and does have one unique thing. She's the world record holder for the fastest circumnavigation in cycling in a global tandem and, and for women, which is pretty crazy. So um, we're going we're gonna to discuss a few things. I think one of the key things is around uh, the, the advantages of multidisciplinary care. Uh, a little bit about the history, certainly about how it started for, for both Dr. Hyman Patterson and, and Professor Hardiman, uh, some of the hurdles, some of the changes you've seen over the years, and then what I'd like to do, and that's why I was hoping Jess maybe can keep me on time, is, uh, is figure out what you all see as the future of multidisciplinary care and proper care for people living with ALSMD. So I'll start uh, by asking a question. I'm going to sit down uh, around um, maybe with Dr. Hyman Patterson to start the value of multidisciplinary care. Testing? Yeah, sorry. Um, I don't think anyone in this room uh, has to be told what the value of multidisciplinary care is in ALS, and the literature would bear it out. We improve quality of life. We improve function. Uh, we, we improve survival. And on an emotional level, uh, we support people through the, the course of this illness. Uh, and it has enough value that it's been incorporated into the principles of care in the US uh, for ALS. However, and we'll probably talk about this, it's not like it's covered real well, right? And we all know that too, that, it, that it's a struggle to keep our centers complete in the US and fully staffed and, and paid for without a lot of heat coming down on us. But, there's no one in this room that needs, needs to be told why this is important. And more importantly, I think from the PALS perspective, they find it very helpful to have one stop shop. If anyone wants to add to that. Orla, did you have something to add? Right, um, Terry, and all the things you said. Um, I, think we, I think what happens in the multidisciplinary clinic, and we've tried to map this out because we've, we've looked at the impact of people who attend our clinic versus people who don't because we have a register in Ireland and actually um, other centres in Italy and the Netherlands and the UK have also done this. And and there's a clear survival benefit, which, which is... Um, independent of everything else that, that, that um, or all the other determinants, you know, whether people are younger or, or um, come the earlier course of their disease. And trying to unpick what is actually happening in the clinic, we, we call it the X factor. 
Uh, uh, what I think it probably is 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 what um, you mentioned, da David, um, which is the idea that actually the neurologist is kind of the least important person there. We you know we make the diagnosis and we we might prescribe, but the, it's an iterative process. The 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 benefit that's conferred is 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 a le cross learning, cross disciplinary, ongoing iterative commu communication across the corridor. And that changes how we behave. It changes how we think. It changes um, the decisions that we make many times to the benefit because because there's a conversation that's happening all the time in the clinic with the person with the with ALS and their family member at the centre of that. And I I, I think that's um, that's quite unique actually. And I I think that is that what, what that X factor is trying to parse it out. And work at the communication streams. We've been trying to do that, you know, to, to try and to try and um, make this as efficient as possible, uh, and uh, to digitalize it sometime in the future, you know, to improve the technologies around that. But I think that's what's going on. I think it's an iterative, cross learning process. I always learn something from my colleagues in the clinic, and I think that's really important. I think that's true of all my colleagues. Actually, before we move on on that, I was wondering, maybe you, you touched upon briefly, uh, Professor Hardiman, about um, the work that was done to actually show that multidisciplinary care was actually had a, a significantly longer uh, effect for people for survival um, versus those who are just having neurologist care. And uh, do you think that that's something that's maybe undersold when we talk about even therapies and you know the, the, the desire to get onto therapies, but how proper care is such a important treatment in a sense for the evolution of that and the, the betterment of that to, for people? Uh, absolutely. And, it's, and let me just comment, it's not only survival, it's the quality of that survival that's really important, which is what the the ancillary support, our allied healthcare professionals really enhance that quality of life by maximizing function and enabling people to do the things they want to do. But I only need to point out the effect of non-invasive ventilation. Um, I can make the argument that that has more effect on survival than any of the medications that we, we have to date. And the proper implementation of non-invasive ventilation, we still don't know what the best way is. We just know that if we, you know, if, if we institute non-invasive ventilation, it, it certainly is going to enhance survival if, if folks are able to use it. That's a whole other issue, but, but there's so much work to be done just in the proper implementation of NIV. But again, uh, you know, it's not sort of an exciting thing when there's clinical trials going on to, to fund, which is optimizing the clinical tools that we have in the here and now that can be used to improve quality of life and survival. Because people who are compliant with their BiPAP, they're less fatigued, they have, uh, it has a cognitive effect, and it has a survival effect. Well, also, also the, the decision I guess that's my respiratory <laughs> therapist colleagues. Professor Hardiman, I think. Thank you. You wanted to add to that? Uh, uh, what I was going to say was the decision making around interventions is really important. Um, we, we, we've shown this, but it's been shown in other studies as well. So, so you're right, Terry. The use of NIV, it, it's an intervention, and it is the most effective intervention compared to all the interventions that we have, including medications at the moment. The the, the other thing is decision making around, for example, nutritional support. Um, not everybody is suitable for gastrostomy. And and um, there are instances where putting in a gastrostomy is actually the wrong thing to do. Multidisciplinary uh, clinics help to make those really difficult decisions. They they attenuate the moral distress that we all feel in put, when we are under pressure to do something that we know probably isn't correct, like putting in a gastrostomy tube in somebody who, for whom it wouldn't really benefit. Um, so I think that sort of decision making process is 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 really important as well. There's also a lot of evidence that engagement with a multidisciplinary clinic reduces the number of people who attend the emergency room and, and also reduces um, um, accidental, um, not um, full mechanical ventilation, certainly in Europe. Uh, so so I, I, I think, I, I think, you know, it, it's actually really good value for money. It, it actually saves money in the longer term as well. So, so not funding it is, is not very clever. 
by by um, health agencies because it actually it actually improves outcome, but it also is much more efficient in terms of the delivery of care because it reduces the um, ancillary um, or the, the in, in, inappropriate. Um, interventions and and in, um, inappropriate use of, of emergency room and inappropriate uh, mechanical ventilation that occurs by accident. So actually, maybe I'll also turn it over to Sarah and Rachel in terms of both this and and can come back to the history piece. But in terms of changes that you've seen in your time in multidisciplinary care that that today are mm -hmm. huge advancements, because I know NIV was mentioned and, and nutrition and. Right, right, and um, is this, that's on now. So I've been thinking about a lot of things as, as everyone's speaking here, and I had the unique um, perspective that when I, Dr. Hyman Patterson had started the ALS clinic at the hospital where I was working in 1984, 82, 82 and then I didn't start there until 1994. See, not as old. and. <laughs> So, but Nobody's I, as old. <laughs> but I've only ever worked in a, mul a fully multidisciplinary clinic. So I just thought that's what everyone did for ALS. I mean, I had been in rehab before that, and we had multidisciplinary clinics for people with spinal cord injuries, or amputees would see OT and PTs in a clinic and things like that. So I had a that's all I ever knew. <laughs> so it wasn't until we, I started coming to these meetings and realized that that's not what everyone, what everyone else um, had available to them. And just to speak to some of the, the, like Orla was saying, when somebody's deciding to get a peg tube, they're not just, it's not just something that the doctor's recommending it and the nutritionist is talking to them. It's not just those two people. It's also the nurse is talking to them about it and the care. And the speech therapist is talking to them about when they might need it based on if they're having difficulty chewing and swallowing. Or maybe the OT is talking to them about it because they're going to need to, maybe they can't use their hands and they're going to need help. So it truly, every, it's almost like every single decision you're making is multidisciplinary. It's not just... Well, that's the speechy, or that's the nutritionist, or that's the PT. And I think um, in the UK, anyway, the MND Association were absolutely kind of groundbreakingly visionary in the way that they kind of 20 years, 30 years ago, they started the MND um, network, care centers, and they um, initially started funding care centers in. Um, places where patients wouldn't have to travel very far. And as these care centres have grown and developed, there's now 22 across um, the UK. And I think when we first started our M&D care centre, it wasn't very multidisciplinary. Well, it was bio say <laughs> There was Kevin and I. And I think what's changed most of all is we could see patients and they'd come, be sitting in front of us and we could see they had respiratory failure and they were huffing and puffing and really distressed and they weren't sleeping and they couldn't do, it could do very little, they could move very, just because the respiratory function was so poor and there was absolutely nothing we could do about it because we didn't have access to NIV. And we didn't know anybody who wanted to help us and in fact everybody was very clear that they didn't want to help us because our patients were they thought we were very complex and so we bought well the MD association helped us buy three machines and we were able to give these and i worked out how to use them and that's grown and we now have hundreds of patients on M on niv and we now have the care the uh, sleep and ventilation team on board we have the nutritionists on board we have and the whole thing has grown and evolved, and I think that's what's quite extraordinary about the team. It's not just kind of multidisciplinary, it's the team is the vital word. And it's not that there's disciplines in it kind of working, but they're working together with the same common goal, and they're doing the same thing. And, you know, I think Kevin and I, he, I think we, we have telepathy. So I know what he's going to tell me, or I know he doesn't tell me because I know what he's thinking. And he knows what I've thought of very might be my face but he but the whole team we work in the same direction with the same aims and the same kind of 
in, kind of eyes insight for the patients. And I think that's the team that's so valuable. And that's what's changed over the time for me. Well, I'd like, I'd like to also comment that once snagged into ALS, always in ALS, mm -hmm. that the team that I have now, there's no one on my team under 17 years with me. And, you know, it, it's, it's something that those of us who become committed are committed for life. Uh, my husband says, I'll die at my desk. But You're not retiring? <laughs> it's not imminent. But, but you know, the, the commitment, because of PALS, they inspire us and they really make us just want to do all we can. And I think that's what keeps people going. And one of the changes that I've seen also is the implementation of some of prevention. I think that's a huge thing. And we'll, we'll see what uh, Orlis says, but in our clinic, you know, and I think in all multidisciplinary clinics, not only ours, we try to educate people on the risks uh, on swallowing proper techniques to prevent some of the complications, to prevent the, you know, talk to them about falls, talk to them. And so with a multidisciplinary team, uh, you, that's another area that's an advantage because you sort of have some knowledge base that, that to prevent things and also to promote better health. Uh, breathing exercises, stack breathing, uh, expiratory muscle training, these can impact you know, how long before you need, you know, your respiratory muscle strength, as well as even swallowing. And more recently, we've, we've heard from Emily Plowman and her group that, that you know, uh, inspiratory muscle training and expiratory muscle training can, can impact swallow function as, as well as respiratory function. So these preventative measures that, that kind of help maintain health have also, I've seen, grow as, as we want to get better and better in our care. I, I think the theme that you're you're drawing on there, Terry, is um, the concept of expertise, and expertise is is about people seeing um, all the nuances in a condition in all its iterations um, for a very long time, and 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 um, you know the sort of telepathic communication that happens between people who've been working for long periods of time together, and that works very much to the advantage of the people that we that we serve and that we care for. Um, uh, I think the difference between, you know, having a clinic where you see a speech therapist and and, and an occupational therapist and a physiotherapist, um, you know, on different days, and and you might see the junior OT one day, and you might be lucky to see the senior uh, physio the next week. Um, in 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 the multidisciplinary clinic, they're one stop shops, but they're also um, entities that um, where there's where there's national expertise. So these are the places, the go to places. And, and expertise breeds excellence, and and the excellence then is self perpetuating, uh, and and I think the, all of us you know have that uh, privilege of having worked with people for you know many years. I think if we had to drop all the people around the table, barring David because he's only a baby, um, um, you know we, we're probably about maybe a thousand years between us <laughs> for all the people, all the person years that have been dedicated, you know, in in in, in the group here. And, and I think that is the difference. And the second thing is that there still is quite a bit of therapeutic nihilism around um, about MNG. I, I'm, I'm sorry to say that it, it's present in, in, in Ireland. It's also present in the UK, um, where where we still have colleagues who say, oh, well, there's not a lot we can do, really. So, you know, there's no point really sending you off to a specialist clinic. What would they do or what, what would they know? So there is some education that we need to do around this idea that cohorting people um, in centres of excellence, provides excellent care and has very good outputs. And even if you have a condition that is life-limiting, that doesn't mean that you don't deserve to have excellent care and that we can't make a difference. I, I saw three ALS patients today. Um, one woman was only 41 with five children under the age of eight, and, and she was devastated by her diagnosis. But we can make a difference. We, we can walk the walk with her. We can do stuff. We can intervene. We can predict, as, as Terry was saying, we can, we, can, um, uh, uh, we can make her life better, notwithstanding. I was saying to her today, today is the worst day of your life. It gets better from now because you're supported. You know, we have the team that'll, that'll help her to walk this walk and we'll walk the walk with her. And that's the difference, I think, isn't it? 
It's a very powerful message. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. I also think um, you hit on something really big with education, and that just actually took me back to when I, when I first started in 1994, and I knew nothing about ALS MND, nothing. You know, I don't remember ever getting anything in school. I don't know allied health professionals. Maybe now you do. But back then, there were, we really didn't learn anything. And you couldn't Google. When you were looking for articles, David, on beginning multidisciplinary clinics, there, there, was no, there were no resources out there, books, perhaps. And then I came to the allied health professional meeting in 2004 in Philadelphia. And that's when I was like, these are people doing the same work I'm doing. I, I wanted to just talk to everyone in the room. I wanted to soak in everything that you had to say and just learn about what other people were doing. And so it was meetings like this where you could to get that education and get that expertise. And so now as you get to this side of it, now this is what we want to do where we're trying to give back and, and make sure that everyone has the ability. And that's a big difference because back then you couldn't find the information and now there's much more information out there. It's more readily available to physical therapists, occupational therapists. It's, it's not great. There still needs to be some work done, but it's much uh, the educational piece so that you can get to that expert level is, is um, more readily available. Thank you. I just wanted to double back for a moment, and, and Sarah, you had mentioned that, you know, multidisciplinary care in your clinic was, when you arrived, was already fully ensconced, and, and I know Dr. Hyman Patterson, we've discussed this, and you've said that it was just the thing to do when you started your clinic, that there was already precedent set, but I know Professor Hardiman, you've also mentioned that it was a struggle, and, and, and that when you look in the UK even, or in Ireland, it wasn't until several years later that this was fully adopted as the model. And so I was wondering if maybe you might elaborate on some of those struggles you had in the early days of trying to set up multidisciplinary care. Well, I, I suppose I should preface it by saying that I went back to Ireland from my training in the US and um, I was the 11th neurologist in the country. Uh, so there was, um, the population was around 3.5 million at the time. It's, it's 5.5 million now, actually. But... Um, so I was, there was 11 neurologists in the country. I was number 11. I was uh, the second woman and I was the youngest. So um, I, I joined a, a hospital where the, um, my two colleagues were a bit like the two guys from the, from the Muppet Show. Um, <laughs> they, they weren't very impressed. And when I started saying things like, you know, I really think that we could learn something from our colleagues in uh, you know, physiotherapy and occupational therapy, I was told in, uh, um, uh, in, in no uncertain terms that... Um, um, there was nothing that a, that a doctor could learn from a, 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 a another another um, you know, discipline. Uh, there was a, a, a very strong um, gender-based um, uh, um, undertone to that conversation as well. I have to say because uh, most of the doctors are men and most of the healthcare professionals were women. Um, so when when, when we did uh, go about setting up uh, the Montreal Clinic in, in 1994. It was with the support of other like-minded um, heads of departments in physiotherapy and occupational therapy and speech and language therapy, all of whom are still all retired now, but still good friends. And when we wrote the first paper, um, I think it was in 2000, uh, showing that uh, multidisciplinary care improved outcome, and we published it in, a, in an international journal, some of my colleagues wrote a, a, a rebuttal letter um, criticising the paper and criticizing the, the uh, statistical methodology that we'd used to show that multidisciplinary care improves outcome. Um, but, you know, evidence is evidence. And, and um, I think it was one of the first papers, really, that, because we had a register that was able to demonstrate this um, you know, f fairly conclusively. And, of course, there's been many other publications since then. We, we repeated uh, the paper then in the work in 2016. We compared two different jurisdictions, the north of Ireland, which is... Um, under the NHS in the, in the UK and, and the south of Ireland, and a very good multidisciplinary clinic in Belfast run by Colette Donnie. It's an MND care centre, but the care is devolved, so Colette sees people, and then they devolve back into local services, whereas we, we remain involved and we make all the decisions, and, and we showed a difference there as well. So that's what I'm saying. It's not just um, 
having the multidisciplinary team. It's, it's, it's the ongoing care and the center of expertise and the iterative process that makes a difference. So it's a long time uh, since you know we had the problem setting up. I, 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 Ireland has changed a lot, and I think the UK has changed a lot since then. Um, but um, we're very proud of what we do, and, and the people who set up the clinic with me, Bernie Core, uh, still works with me. We, we, we've grown old together. And I've brought many other members of the team who've been with us for many years as well. Um, as, as Terry said, it's uh, once we put people become involved, they, they they don't generally leave after that. And Rachel, I know you had mentioned that some people didn't want to help you in the early days of setting up a doctor at all, but did you also find that even in the early 2000s, there was still some people who believed in the one neurologist model, or was it by that point maybe a little bit more common to have? Well, I think. In the UK? In that, at that time, there was, I mean, Prof Talbot was the only neurologist who had an interest in MND, so, but there were 18 different neurologists in Oxford, and everybody um, was seeing people with MND and would give varying advice from, yeah, well, there's nothing we can do, go and live your life, or, and it, and it was one by one, one neurologist by one neurologist that were referred to us. <laughs> and it, and I, you know, we used to celebrate when some of the neurologists were slower to, to refer, but eventually all of them were. And that's when we developed, we were able to see everybody and kind of give everybody the care that they, they really needed. And I think you also, on the wards, um, you work with your colleagues and you spy people who have a bit more of an interest in M&D and you kind of not gro groom is possibly the wrong term now, but you do look, kind of look after those people and encourage them to come and work with you and spend more time and then you start to kind of build um, bigger, bigger teams and bigger interests and they want to be with you um, and they want to be working with you because they see that you have a kind of a, a shared goal for those, for those patients. And I think, ultimately, I don't think we had any resistance. I think the, the tricky thing was that in the past, before there was a care centre, when a patient with MND got into difficulty, like in the respiratory centre, where they had, um, at those that time, there was one patient that had a tracheostomy and he wanted it removed. And now I know we've come a long way to our ethics and how we manage that. But at the time, they didn't want to take it out and he wanted it out. So there was a whole legal debate about whether it should come or go. And at that point, the respiratory um, department said, we're never having another patient with MD because they've been here for three months and caused great trouble. And so that's what that was their reluctance. But now they know that they, they stay with us and under our umbrella and we look after them wherever they are, that we take responsibility and it's, it's a much better relationship. But initially it's hard, to, it kind of, it's just hard to kind of make in the beginning a kind of um, relationship and then it builds with a trust, I think. And that's, uh, so it's very helpful, but it gets there eventually. Well, I, I have to say that the reason I'm in ALS was a young woman who my first diagnosis of ALS is an attending. And uh, she, she was on a, a ventilator. She actually presented in respiratory failure, and that's how we made the diagnosis. And she wanted to come off the ventilator, and it, it was actually one of the cases in, in the U.S. where it, it sort of uh, paved the way for the legality of withdrawal of care. And so, but uh, you, you make me think of some other comments about uh, that while it isn't, and we can talk about this later, while it wasn't hard to, to sort of sail that multidisciplinary care was the way to go in ALS, how that was supported was a whole different kettle of fish. I mean, that, that was, you know, that's fine, it's a good way to do it, but who's going to pay for it? Um, and, and so that was uh, a difficulty. And then, uh, you know, while in the U.S., or at least in my sphere where I worked, uh, the nihilism was equal, that there was nothing you can do, but, but I always like to say it was like a hot potato. So if you had an ALS, uh, somebody who ha was diagnosed with ALS, the faster you could send them to me, the better. And typically it was with a diagnosis, oh, you don't have ALS, you have motor neuron disease. And... and <laughs> or some other euphemistic term that equated with with ALS. So that was some of the experiences. And I still have that experience uh, because there's still the nihilistic feeling in the community a lot. 
And my favorite lecture to give is ALS a treatable disease. And so, but those are just some comments that listening to I, you, Rachel. I think, I think you're, you're right, Terry. We, we did a, a, a study looking at the patient journey and um, we're looking at the length of time it takes to come to the multidisciplinary clinic and the reasons for the delays. And um, w when we looked at how long it takes to see a neurologist and then how long it takes for the neurologist to refer to the multidisciplinary clinic um, the, the, and try to dig into the, what the delays are, I, I think there's, there is there, there are two things that we learned from that. One is that um, the, there's... There's a reluctance to make the diagnosis and um, breaking bad news. We're not, not very good at. We're not very good at teaching people how to break bad news. Um, and and the, the, the desire to um, do the, that one more test that might uh, confirm or, um, or not the diagnosis. So, so delaying things with, with um, um, tests that, that you know, probably, probably are, are not very sensible, sensible and quite expensive. And also, to some extent, relying, for example, on on the neurophysiology to to prove the diagnosis, um, so so I think that the multidisciplinary clinic um, is very helpful. Getting people to the multidisciplinary clinic early, when they have features that might suggest ALS, is actually quite valuable as well, because we can make the call, for example, in people with bulbar disease with with minimal changes on EMG, um, which often delays the diagnosis in, in in those people, or where the DMG changes may may be not very. Um, extensive, but but clinically the picture is that of ALS. I think we can have the competence to make that diagnosis, and also um, because uh, the clinic is multidisciplinary and because it's 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 a joint initiative with a number of different professionals that support each other. We can do that really difficult, distressing, um, uh, breaking bad news, and supporting people in in, in as their world falls apart in front of them. Um, in a way that also protects us because we protect each other. And that's really important. I think that part of our professional job is really difficult. And I think I think being in the safety of a multidisciplinary clinic where we have one another that support one another makes that job more doable and makes it it's better for the person with the disease as well because we can engage with them in, in a much more upfront way. And I think that's really important. And I think it does speed up the diagnosis as well, especially in those cases where... The, you know, the referring doctor may not be entirely sure or may not want to admit that they don't really know. That happens a little bit as well in, in our, in our um, services. Okay, well, we're, we're down to about 13 minutes and, and I would leave time for a question or two at the end, but what I would really like to hear from all four of our esteemed panelists would be great is what do you think is the future? I know her, earlier today we heard about Bridges for Hope um, or Bridges of Hope. Um, at the Alliance meeting, um, which is really amazing as well, but perhaps um, we could go through each member of the panel and, and talk about you know, your thoughts on where we go, how do we evolve um, multidisciplinary care for ALS. So maybe we'll start with sure. Dr. Hyman Patterson. I, I think that it, it's going to be very much country specific in, in some ways. I mean, in a perfect world where uh, we all had universal health care, uh, it'd be easy if we were all on the same playing field, but we all know that we come from different uh, countries and, and different situations. Um, I think we saw a talk where uh, in, uh, I think it was Japan, uh, a fellow had six different caregivers. We can't get one caregiver every six days now since COVID. Um, it, it's hard to get home health aides, but where would, in a perfect world, I'd like to see multidisciplinary care covered so physicians and team members didn't have to worry about how they're going to keep it together to maintain that level of care and, in fact, have, have additional care members that would be much more social work case management in each center and also have an arm that could go out into the home and, and do what Hope Bridges, and, and bridge the care to make sure there's continuity of care uh, between, between visits. So, so growing that infrastructure to give good care, and then some attention to optimizing plain old good care. Um, you know, funding the studies to know how to, what is the best way to uh, apply NIV? When is the best time to give to put in a feeding tube, you know, we have criteria that we use, but is that the best? And what 
foods? How do you judge caloric intake? Uh, I venture to say that not everybody uses a metabolic cart to really determine the caloric needs of, of a, a pal, but, but it's been shown that the equations don't work for ALS, but yet we all kind of use them. Uh, but but ha tweaking the care that we give uh, in rehab and assistive technology, I want to see more research done in leveraging technologies for the good of people living with ALS. And I, I don't want to take up all the time. I'll leave Sarah and, and Orla and <laughs> Rachel to, to give their view, but, but I want to see a world where we can focus on care and optimizing it in, in, in our clinics as we get new drugs and, you know, not to mention the research arm. But Yeah, I don't know if, I, if I'm thinking of this question as what's the future or what would I wish the best clinic would look like? <laughs> Like, if uh, I, had a pit I think what would what do you think would be optimal? What where where would you like to see things go? Yeah, I think um, um, I would like that the clinics and of course, we'll, I'm thinking of the United States right now is that at every clinic you get to see every person and as Dr. Hyman Patterson just mentioned, and I think assistive technology, assistive technology professionals should be at every clinic. Rachel. I think um, many of the care centers in the UK now have very well established kind of core team of maybe nurses, I and mean, they all vary because not all of them are the same, but they work with the resources that they have. And it's normally a nurse and a physio and an OT as a basic team. And I think now, again, with the association, but the, I think we're going the next step in thinking about mental health and psychology and very much bringing the psychologists into the team, which I can't tell you how fantastic that's been, not only for the staff working with the patients, but also obviously the patients and their families. It's been phenomenal. And I, and I think it's just kind of being able to get the, the kind of the icing on the cake and thinking about art therapy. And we know music therapy is invaluable and all those things that have barely we, uh, kind of scratched the surface because we've been in our kids so busy doing the basic care. And now we've got a, a reasonably well-established team with more, we have a kind of full-time OT and a nurse, well, two nurses. We can do more and we can kind of do the things we've always wanted to do. And I think, you know, pres prescribing exercises and, and kind of, it's the social life and the kind of allowing people to really live well and better. Yeah, absolutely. Professor Hardiman, the future. Oh. Yeah, so we actually have uh, a fully funded team funded by the health service executive. We have five nurses um, who work with us and another five to the Motor Neurons Association. We have a full team, including a full-time senior psychologist as well. Um, what I'd like to see um, is um, I mean, that, that's improving that sort of bridging, uh, making sure that the continuity of care which we have, where the nurses go into people's homes, and continue to support and the and integrate with the community services. I think the the problems that we encounter, and, and I think it's true across the board, certainly in the UK, um, is that the 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 travel time for patients coming to a specialist clinic is significant, and the wait time is significant. No matter what we do, and we've been doing this for nearly thirty years, we that can't seem to be able to reduce the wait time for people in the clinic. Um, to less than maybe two or three hours where they're sitting there not being not being in, interacted with by a professional and so we so we we've been experimenting with um uh, chris mcdermott's uh, telemedicine and mnd uh, system uh, so using technologies to try and um streamline um the needs of the people to maximize the time that they have in the clinic and minimize uh, the waiting time that they have sitting around <laughs> and also to try and um, expedite the um, or to try and improve the the, the travel time uh, to to ensure that the visit is is, is um, good value for time invested by the person coming to the clinic and to do as much as we can as close to home as possible so bringing the care by our expert team into the home so so devolving the care out but not in the community, not to the community service, but with our own teams moving out into the community, as Terry was saying. So I think um, making the clinics more efficient, reducing the sitting around, uh, waiting to be seen by the by the therapies, um, and um, 
improving the um, the outreach, uh, and I think using um, uh, telehealth to try and maximise that. We're, we're we're trying to build um, um, digital solutions to to many of these problems um, and do as much care in the home as possible. I think is the way to go from our point of view. Thank you. Um, so. Jess had said there was a few questions online that people had. Were there, would, did you want to? Okay, we'll take one virtual question, one from in the room. So it's a game show now. Who can ha put their hand up first and most forcefully? I think that's. Okay, this is from Diane from the ALS Society of Quebec. Um, she. Diane says, given that ALS oops, just went away. Given that ALS cases can be few and far between for healthcare professionals working in the community regions, some allied healthcare professionals providing community care across different disciplines, social work, nutritionists, OTs, etc., can find it challenging to develop and maintain expertise and keep up ongoing standards of care in ALS. How do you suggest this gap between multidisciplinary ALS clinics and ambulatory community settings be bridged to better support patients and their caregivers over the course of their ALS journey? Yeah, that's, uh, that's been an ongoing issue for many years. And we, you know, we try and do a lot of educational pieces in our area. We cover several states, so it's difficult to go out and educate every community, um, every home care agency, every group that's out there, but we try and provide information. We try and do educational, like we're willing to go out and talk to any group. Um, there are educational pieces out there if maybe we need to do more. Let's, <laughs> the Alliance can help do more. <laughs> The, the other thing is that when somebody is referred to an agency, um, we often, Sarah, you'll often call and go over things with the provider from the agency, the PT or, or you know, our OT, our team members will talk with the member of the agency to, to kind of review mm -hmm. what, what we're expecting and what the expectations should be. We're not, you know, with, with the PALS. And it's, it's one of the goals of our programming is, is to educate our surrounding community. And I think each center almost has a responsibility to educate the resources in the community who they're going to rely on in the home if they can't themselves do the home uh, care. Okay, I think, it's, I think tele, tele, telehealth has a role here. I mean, the COVID pandemic showed us that. So I, I think... Um, both both interaction with with uh, community service and training community services digitally and um, virtually has worked very well for us and also uh, providing linkages uh, uh, for for virtual consultations in, in, in situations where travel might be difficult we experimented with that during covid as well so i think there's a lot that we can do with telehealth as well that w that we haven't really been harnessing as well as we might okay and i think we had a, a question over here or is it Sally? I can't see. I'm sorry. The light. The light. So, I'm sorry. The light. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Sally Light. I work for the M&D Association of England, Wales and Northern Ireland. And um, you've all got amazing services for which I thank and congratulate you. But uh, we've recently done some work in England, Wales and Northern Ireland and found that we just, in spite of all that we've invested over the last 30 years, we still don't have anything like universal coverage of multidisciplinary care. And um, we're now busy investing in um, coordination posts across the three countries. And we've heard that some of that's the same as well in Canada and the US over the last few days. So if I was answering the future question, I'd say that what you provide to your patients should be provided to everybody. And that's what we need to strive for next. Not a question. Well said. Do we want to take one last question over here and then from Felipe? And then. No? Okay. Um, Jess, I think are we at time or? Okay. We have time for one more question. I think he said it's. It, does someone have one last question in the room? Anyone who wants? Kat, Kathy, or you have a virtual one? Okay.
And this is a message from Kevin Robinson. I'd be interested to hear panel members' thoughts on having a PALS, CALS person involved in advocacy as part of the team. Multidisciplinary team. Was the question if the multidisciplinary team should be involved in advocacy? Having an actual PALS or a caregiver oh, as pal. part of the multidisciplinary team um, focused on advocacy. I think that's a, a really interesting concept. And I think um, for people living with ALS, it's a huge amount of effort and responsibility to kind of come to a clinic and be part of that. We do have volunteers in our clinic um, that talk and chat to patients while they're waiting and their families, and that very much is very often a family member of somebody who's lived with um, ALS and MND. And we've never had, interestingly, anybody offer to, to come and help, but I think we'd very much um, look into that and think about it and welcome it if they were very keen. I, th I think there are there, there are panels. Chris McDermott has has championed this um, panels with of of people um, who who are affected by the disease, either people themselves or or caregivers, um, who advise on the um, how the clinic operates and and um, and developing better outcome measures and, and that. And to to my mind, that's a, that's probably a better use of that sort of expertise than than sitting in a clinic. Also, I'm not sure that um, certainly in 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 Ireland, I'm not sure that the people with the disease w would be am amenable to somebody who's not professionally trained coming in and, and being involved in the clinic. I, I'm, and actually, I think my hospital would, ha would have a problem with that as well from a, a GDPR pers perspective, j j data protection. So I think it's a good idea, but I think there are better ways. There are ways of, of implementing that or using that sort of skill set in a way that, that could make our clinics work more efficiently. Absolutely. Terry, last word. Well, last word. No. No, I was going to say, Orly, you're right on that, that um, we need our pals and cows to advise us on what we can do better in terms of the clinic. And, and I know that we have uh, sort of brokered some groups of pals who get together to talk about things and also some groups of cows that like to talk to each other on a, on a social level, and it, it kind of helps them. It's different than coming in to advocate for a clinic, but, it, but it's also a support system that within the, the group of pals and cows is, is helpful for them. Uh, but definitely, I think the advising us how to do better and what, because what, after all, that's what it's all about. We wanna, we wanna do what pals and cows feel are most important, not what we, we think is most important or the best way to do things. They, may know better. It's about them. It's about people living with ALS. That's a brilliant way to end it. Thank you so much. Everyone, please round of applause for these amazing panelists. Such an honor.